This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation with Stephen E. Landsberg, professor of economics at the University of Rochester, author of Slate's Everyday Economics column, and author most recently of the book The Big Questions, tackling the problems of philosophy with ideas from mathematics, economics, and physics. It's the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. I'm joined today by Stephen E. Landsberg, professor of economics at the University of Rochester and author of Slate's Everyday Economics column, as well as books like The Armchair Economist, More Sex is Safer Sex, and now The Big Questions, tackling the problems of philosophy with ideas from mathematics, economics, and physics. Stephen, welcome to the program. Thanks very much. Considering that your previous books, which I've read and enjoyed, brought the principles of economics to every possible area of everyday life that I could think of. What brought about this broadening where you took it to the level of the grandest questions people could possibly discuss for the new book? Well, those, those grand questions are the ones that, that have kept me awake nights since I was uh, uh, an adolescent. Uh, <laughs> questions like, why is there something instead of nothing? Where did the universe come from in the first place? How is it possible for us to know things? Uh, how do we know that the things that we think we know are not just illusions? Where do our beliefs come from? What justifies our beliefs? Um, does anything justify our beliefs? How do we know the difference between right and wrong? Uh, those, those are questions that um, I'll, I'll, I'll spoil this right up front and tell you that I'm not sure that I have exactly the right answers to all of those questions. But uh, I do think that some of the subjects that I know something about, which are primarily economics and mathematics and to a lesser extent physics, are subjects that... Um, illuminate those questions, and uh, I illuminate those questions sometimes in ways uh, that are more productive than the ways that philosophers have of thinking about those questions, and, and, and that's what the book is about, and I was eager to write it uh, because uh, I think uh, there are, uh, first of all, because this stuff is illuminating, and second of all, and probably more importantly, because it's fun. This is something you touch on later in the book, but how far did you go down the actual pure philosophy path before thinking that might not be the way to satisfy these intellectual desires you had? Well, you know, I, I, I did uh, uh, at age 16 and 17 think that maybe philosophy was what I wanted to study. In fact, uh, uh, I remember at an earlier age um, convincing myself that philosophy is the only subject that, that uh, suitable for study because, after all, it's only philosophy that can tell us what is valuable, and if you don't study philosophy first, you might spend your entire life doing something that's not valuable and never know it. Uh, as, I, as I matured, I, I came to believe that uh, uh, you really don't need to spend a lifetime studying philosophy to convince yourself that uh, finding a cure for cancer is a valuable thing to do, or that improving the economy and figuring out how to bring people out of poverty is a valuable thing to do. That reason for concentrating in philosophy went away. And uh, also, I found... Uh, at least at that age, uh, when I tried to read philosophy, I completely believed whoever I was reading. I would read one person, and, and everything made sense, and then I would read somebody else who said exactly the opposite, and everything made sense. And I ended up concluding that I did not have, perhaps, the sort of critical mind that one needed to, to read philosophy. Uh, nowadays, I'm probably a more critical reader, and I'd, be, I'd have the opposite problem, that, that uh, I would disbelieve everything I read. Um, but I, I have uh, talked in the book about how about some of the critical ways of thinking that one picks up uh, from math, from 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 economics, bringing those critical ways of thinking to bear on philosophical problems and trying to use them to sort out nonsense from from useful ideas. And when your book gets talked about, this idea of taking, say, mathematical methods and applying them to philosophical questions, that seems almost like like a novelty, like something someone wouldn't necessarily think of doing. And I would say you do it profitably in the book, but why, why, is it, why does it strike the reader as such a rarity that somebody would take mathematical ways of reasoning, for example, or economic ways of reasoning, and bring them to bear on philosophical questions? Well, I think it, it may be um, less novel than it, than, it, than, uh, than it strikes you or than it strikes the usual reader. I mean, after all... Uh, uh, 
what are those big questions of philosophy? One is, where did the universe come from? We all know that physicists have something to say about that. Uh, um, how can we know things? We all know that mathematicians have thought hard about that question. Mathematicians have thought hard, for example, about the difference between what is true and what is provable. Uh, one of the themes uh, that comes up multiple times in the big questions is is that precisely that distinction that what is true in mathematics is not the same as what is provable and 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 what that implies for how we should think about truth and provability in general. Um, uh, everybody knows that philosophers think about the question of of right and wrong. Everybody knows that economists think about the questions of how our actions affect other people. And the question of how our actions affect other people is not entirely distinct from the question of what's right and what's wrong. So uh, I think it's really very natural to bring these things to bear. And I think it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a radical thing to do. Philosophers have always uh, turned to the sciences and the social sciences uh, to, to, to enlighten them. Uh, Dan Dennett, who is uh, one of the most prominent philosophers living today, I think has gotten much farther than most other philosophers in his thinking about free will and his thinking about uh, uh, the, 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 the nature of humanity by, uh, by virtue of his um, deep understanding of subjects like biochemistry and neuroanatomy. So uh, there's, there's a long tradition of philosophers uh, turning to other subjects to illuminate their big questions. How much do you agree with this sort of thing Dan Dennett has, has written about? That He says... Philosophy is not so much, and you can tell me if you agree or disagree with this this uh, summation I'm, I'm about to make, but he writes that philosophy is not so much a discipline that itself finds answers, but that it has been successful if it spins off the questions that it discovers to the individual disciplines. Is that a way you regard philosophy? That and um, I think maybe uh, at its best it also brings um, uh, a way of of thinking that allows us to go to the heart of, of asking what are people implicitly assuming when they, when they talk, what, are, what, are, what do they assume that they don't even realize they're assuming, and teasing out those assumptions, asking ourselves whether we really want to accept those assumptions and where they lead. Now, when you're trying to make a book that tackles so many, such a variety of the philosophical big questions, of which I would imagine infinitely many can be formulated. How do, you, how do you decide, or how did you actually decide, which questions would be the right big ones for you to take on with these methods? Well, of course, I was constrained, first of all, by, by having to stick to those questions where I thought I had something interesting to say. Yes. And uh, then um, uh, among those, I had to pick the ones where what I had to say was I thought not only interesting, but also fun to read about. There were a couple of, of topics where I I did think I had something very interesting to say, but it, it, it seemed less fun than some of the other topics, and I wanted the book to be fun to read. But beyond that, uh, there are the, the number of really big questions is um, uh, not that great. Uh, and, and really, the ones that I uh, mentioned early on in the hour here uh, are, are cover a very large part of philosophy. Where does no, how, how can we, how can we uh, know what it's possible to know? How can we know why there is anything at all, how can we know how to behave, and what's the difference between right and wrong? Right there, you've covered an awful, uh, an awfully big uh, chunk of, of philosophy. Now, how we know what we know and, and how we believe, the, or what, why we believe, what is a belief, these are some of what I have found to be the most interesting sections of the big questions. Now, what, what, what was the way, what was your instinct as far as how to how to bring a mathematic economic methods to to the question of how humans know well e- economists are constantly facing the question of how it's possible to know things um, we are often accused of knowing less than we think we know and sometimes <laughs> that's perhaps true uh, but we are uh, always facing the issue of observing two things that occur in tandem and trying to figure out whether there is some causality there or whether there is uh, just a correlation. We see that children who go to preschool earn 30 years later much higher wages than children who didn't go to preschool. Is it the preschool that caused that or is it having the kind of parents who send you to preschool that causes that or is it something else that causes that? Uh, that's, That's a deep question in the theory of knowledge. How could you possibly know that? How could you sort that out? Uh, we see um, 
there are in countries uh, with uh, where people are very uh, poor. We see more civil unrest. Is it the poverty that causes the civil unrest? Is it the civil unrest that causes the poverty? How could you possibly know those things? Economists have had to face that question deeply for a very long time and have some very useful things to say about it. Uh, we have basically two different techniques that we use, uh, sometimes separately and sometimes in tandem, to tease out the difference between correlation and causality. Um, to try to explain those techniques here on the radio might take us a couple more minutes than you would like me to spend, but I think they're, they're spelled out in the book in considerable detail with a lot of examples. In the NBA, in the National Basketball Association, um, uh, white referees call fouls on black players just slightly more often than they call fouls on white players. Uh, you can ask whether, is that evidence of racism? Is it evidence of something else? Is it is evidence, perhaps, of the players behaving differently depending on the race of the referee as opposed to the referee accounting for the race of the player? How could you sort that stuff out? Uh, I talk in the book um, in, in some detail about what auxiliary evidence you could look at to help you know what it's possible to know from the, from the data that you've got. This issue of finding what's causing what, is there a cause, how do we know there's a cause, these things that sound philosophical, they, they've been brought to light, especially these days, with books like the ones you write and books like, say, Levitt and Dubner's Free Economics. People have begun to understand that these are also the kind of things, and at their very core, I suppose, the kind of things economists think about. But considering that you have so much experience talking to the general public through your writing about what economists do and how they think in this way, how much of a task is it still to impress upon people that economists do do some deep thinking about causation like this and don't just talk to each other about inflation or whatever might be assumed? People are often very surprised at how deeply economists have thought about questions of causation. And um, that that's a very, very big part of what economists do, and there are some, uh, uh, Steve Levitt has contributed to that in, in, in one way, uh, other uh, great Nobel Prize winning economists like Dan McFadden, Jim Heckman have uh, contributed to it in ways of surprising depth. They have given us ways of teasing out causation from correlation that uh, 30, 40 years ago people might have thought would be impossible to tease out. You look at the fact that in, um, in states that adopted the Internet earlier, uh, uh, in states where the Internet, uh, of course states don't adopt the Internet, but in states where lots of people got connected to the Internet early on, in those states we saw the number of reported rapes go down. Uh, there are all kinds of stories you could tell about causality there in either direction. Uh, 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 some people have been tempted to say, well, people get on the Internet, they get a hold of pornography, and then they don't have to go out and rape. Uh, other people tell very, very opposite stories. How do you tell which of those stories is right? Um, how do you, how do you um, tease, tease out that information? Uh, economists have come up with remarkable ways of figuring that out, and those methods are very technical and hard to learn. But the ideas underlying those methods are not technical. They're pretty, uh, they're, again, just maybe a little more than you want me to get into trying to explain on the radio, but they're not, if you, if you sit down with a uh, book like The Big Questions and read the chapter, you'll understand the, the basic ideas behind those things. And I think those ideas are fascinating, and I think they're, they're fun to learn about. How accurate would it be for me to say that for an economist, their chief task is to take a look at the world and, and see the world, to perceive the world as a bunch of experiments that have already been done and to figure out how to, how to view those experiments, those natural experiments correctly and to draw information from them. Well, what, what an interesting way of putting it. I, I, my, my initial gut feeling without having thought about it very long is that that's a very useful way to see the world, a very useful way to see what economists do. There is another... Another subject that's sort of tied in with epistemology here you cover, which is the, the issue of belief. And what I found especially fascinating here is when you're talking specifically about religious belief. And I really want to get this right. I don't want to mischaracterize this. But my interpretation of what you've said is that you don't, you don't see as many religious believers as, say, a Richard Dawkins might see in the world. You see a lot of people who profess religious belief, but 
not that many people actually believe in God, to your mind. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, um, you know, Dawkins uh, believes that we have um, an epidemic of religious belief, which he also sees it as his uh, personal crusade to, to stamp out that religious belief. Uh, I, uh, I am skeptical that very many people believe very deeply. Let me try and explain what I mean by that. Most of us, uh, most of our beliefs are largely unexamined, and that's not a criticism of people. That's not saying that people are stupid or hyper- hypocritical or anything like that. Uh, it's saying only that we all have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of energy, and we're all out there trying to be better cab drivers or better, uh, better uh, small business people or better mothers or better fathers, and our time and our energy is limited, so we don't have a lot of time to sit around thinking about how we feel about free trade or how we feel about economic stimulus packages or how we feel about God. Uh, we have gut instincts about how we feel about those things, but for the most part, most of us, most of the time, don't think deeply about those things. And therefore, the conclusions that we reach or that we think we've reached are not necessarily the same conclusions that we uh, uh, would reach if we thought harder about these things. And my, my suggestion is that most religious belief is in that category. It's a gut feeling, but it's not something that people have thought through hard, and it's not something that many people would be willing to defend in a situation where it really mattered, and in a situation where, for example, the lives of their children depended on getting things right. And I, and I think there's a lot of evidence of that. I mean, you, you, you look, for example, at uh, uh, politicians, the way politicians try to sell their programs to people. They're always trying to sell their programs on the basis of how they will improve life here on Earth. They almost never say... Uh, we should adopt this program because it's going to get more people into heaven or because it's going to improve the quality of the afterlife. If people believed the things that they say, and of course when I say the things they say, everyone's different and different people say different things, but if people believed the things that many people say about the importance of the afterlife, the importance of of getting into heaven, and I realize different religions have uh, different doctrines about what it takes to get into heaven, But if people believe the things they say about the importance of that, it would completely dwarf the question of uh, getting through a recession here on Earth, uh, and uh, uh, that would be the uh, a primary way in which we would judge different uh, different uh, policies. Nobody tries to defend policies that way. Nobody tries to sell policies that way, which suggests that the politicians themselves don't believe that uh, don't take these religious doctrines uh, seriously and don't believe that deep down their constituents take them seriously either. And there's something even deeper here, which seems to me, or at least it strikes me as, as being an important pillar of economic thinking, which is that you have to go by, you have to go by human actions and not human testimony if you want to find out what people actually think. Now, I compare that to a discipline like sociology, which sometimes leans fairly heavily on what its subjects report. But with economics, I, I imagine there's you really can't pay attention to what people say they do or say they think. Uh, uh, yes, econo- uh, this, is a, this is a big lesson of economics. Um, the things that people say they do and say they think uh, are often contradicted by the way they behave. And uh, it is, insofar as economics has any doctrines at all, I suppose that one of our doctrines is that it's more important to look at what people do than at what they say. There's a few more issues early on in the book, that I think there's quite an amusing treatment of, well, amusing in a sense, but also quite revealing. Number one is is free will, and you do argue that humans do have free will, but maybe I'm, I'm kind of a little confused at how you get there. How, what, is, what is your free will argument in this book? Well, uh, my free will argument is really, uh, uh, here, here's one where uh, everything uh, I, I know and believe I probably learned from philosophers. There are uh, in most parts of the book, I'm trying to talk about the things that economists and mathematicians and scientists can teach to philosophers. Uh, the, the, the argument on free will is, it, it's, it's a mainstream view in philosophy, and it is that uh, human beings are physical objects. Our, our actions are determined by physical laws, but that doesn't mean we don't have free will. It just means that free will is, is part of the outcome of the physical laws that our bodies uh, satisfy in the same way that the waves in an ocean 
are ultimately uh, caused by the behavior of the molecules in the ocean. But if you were going to try and describe the uh, motion of the waves by going back to looking at the way the individual molecules of water are moving, uh, it would be uh, absurdly complicated to try to describe wave motion in that way. And so we have multiple ways of thinking about why water behaves as it does. We can think of it on the molecular level, which is useful for some purposes. We can think of it at the wave level, which is useful for other purposes. And likewise, uh, when we think about human beings, we can think about things at the level of our no the neurons in our brain and the molecules that make up those neurons, and we can give a purely physical description of, of how those things work, a purely uh, micro-physical description of the way those things work, which satisfies physical laws, and, and uh, there's no reason, there's no evidence, there's no uh, reason in science to think that that behaves any differently than any other conglomeration of molecules. On the other hand, to try to understand human behavior at that level is, is an absurdly um, uh, fruitless project uh, because of the level of complexity. Uh, uh, it is more useful to, when we're thinking about human behavior to think of it at a different level uh, and uh, at that different level, free will is a very useful concept in the same way that notion wave is a very useful concept. This gets at what I consider to be a theme of this book, which is the way humans think about complexity, and specifically the way a lot of humans think about complexity in a way that's wrong. For example, one you gave is that people think about the brain as composed of neurons, and they think of a... They think of a, um, a mechanistic system like that, but they, they think of about a hundred neurons rather than a billion. I mean, is it is it at any point possible to actually conceive of something that complex in, in a human's mind? This is a point I got from Dan Dennett. Um, the uh, uh, people recoil from the idea that uh, our brain is an ordinary physical object. Not ordinary, it's extraordinary by virtue of its complexity, but that it, it, it obeys uh, the ordinary simple physical laws that every other physical object obeys. People have trouble believing that because, as you say, they try imagining uh, a network of a hundred neurons and how they interact with each other, and they say, well, that could never begin to explain my hopes and my feelings and my aspirations and my dreams. But the reason they say that is that they're right. A system of a hundred neurons never could begin to to, uh, to account for that. A system of a billion neurons is a very different animal than a system of a hundred neurons. It's not, just more, it's not just different in the same way, it's different in new ways. The additional, that, that, that vast uh, numerical difference allows for not just more of the same kind of complexity, but for whole new kinds of complexity to emerge. And uh, we have no reason to doubt that, that uh, all of your hopes and dreams and aspirations are uh, uh, reflections of that new kind of complexity that comes out of the, those interactions between those very, very many neurons. Is this the same sort of fallacy, if we can call it that, or a bad habit of thinking that that contributes to sort of the creationist mindset that, well, humans, we're complex, therefore there's probably a god? Yeah, um, and, but, you know, I, I think also uh, uh, I would also fault, um, uh, on the other hand, people like Richard Dawkins on that issue. The creationists say we are complex, and because we are complex, we must have been uh, created by some intelligent designer. Um, uh, Dawkins, on the other hand, comes out and says, no, no, we are complex, therefore we must have evolved from something simple. And uh, Dawkins argues uh, repeatedly in, in his books and in his interviews that everything that is complex can have gotten that way only by evolving from something simple. I think both sides are wrong. And I think what proves both sides wrong is that the most complex things we know about are mathematical things. The most complex objects we know about are mathematical objects. The system of natural numbers with, uh, with the laws of arithmetic uh, sounds very simple, just like those uh, systems of neurons sound very simple, but it gives rise to amazing levels of complexity. Even just at the very beginning, things that are not at all obvious, every number is a sum of four squares, at most four squares. Uh, that follows from the simple laws of arithmetic, one plus one equals two and so on, but it doesn't follow in any obvious way. 
levels of complexity upon complexity upon complexity upon complexity arise from those simple laws of arithmetic, and all that complexity is there and was there and never evolved from every, anything. Arithmetic was always exactly what it is. It never, it, it, it did not evolve. It, it, it is what it is. Uh, it was not created. Uh, even the creationists, I think, would recoil from the idea that God created arithmetic. That would suggest that God could have created it otherwise, that he could have made two plus two equal five. Uh, most theologians uh, don't believe. Most theologians will tell you that God is uh, restricted by the laws of logic and could not have done that. Arithmetic was what it was, and even God couldn't have changed it. So that tells you that a complex object does not have to have had a, a, a creator or a designer. But it also tells you that a complex object does not have to evolve from have to have evolved from something simple. So I think that uh, because uh, certainly there was no evolution toward toward arithmetic. So I think uh, uh, if we take the very basis of their arguments, the creationists are wrong when they say that complexity requires a designer, and uh, Dawkins is wrong when he says that complexity requires evolution. I do believe that life on Earth uh, arose through something very like Darwinian evolution. I do believe that, but I don't believe Dawkins when he says that's the only way it could have happened. And this ties in with a concept at the heart of what you say, well, much of what you say in the beginning or the, the first half of the book, which is what follows from what mathematics is. And also one of the kind of funny parts of your book, I thought, is that you talk about ESP, extrasensory perception. And the argument is that we have it because we perceive certain things without the use of senses, one of those things being mathematical truths. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but th those are all things we don't need senses to know. That, that's right. Uh, we, we, we know mathematical truths, um, uh, and we know, them, uh, uh, we know them, it seems to me, without sensory input. We, uh, you might say that... Uh, you learned that two plus two is four by putting two stones in a pile and putting another two stones in a pile and counting them, and that you used your senses to do that. You used your eyes, you used your hands. Um, but uh, there are deeper facts about mathematics that we all seem to know at a very deep level uh, where uh, direct sensory input is not so relevant. And the most important of those is the consistency of arithmetic, the fact that if you uh, add up some numbers and then add them up in a different direction, you're always going to get the same answer. There's never going to be an exception to that. If you multiply two numbers and then multiply them in the opposite order, you're never going to get a different answer. There are no exceptions to that. These are things that I, that it seems to me, um, and I, I'm, as with so many things in the book, I could be wrong about this, but it seems clear to me, and I do talk in the book about why it seems clear to me, that uh, we know these things and we don't need our senses in order to know them. We could be blind and deaf and have no senses of taste or smell or feeling, and we would still know these things. Uh, that makes them extrasensory, and certainly they are perceptions, so I count them as ESP in, in the mainstream sense of what ESP means. Now, this seems to me to be such an important part of, of many of the arguments that you make in this book, the, the pre-sensory nature of mathematics or, or the, the existence of mathematical truths outside of truths as we normally conceive them in other subject areas. And how foundational is that to the arguments you make in this book? Well, it's foundational to some of the arguments and not to others. It's, it's foundational to several of them. Um, it's certainly foundational to what I have to say about the origins of the universe. And, and there, I start with the idea, and uh, again, if this idea is wrong, then everything I have to say on this subject is wrong. But I start with the idea that mathematics is not a human construction. It's something that exists that humans discover as opposed to something that humans create. If you talk to the great mathematicians, uh, almost to a person, uh, they will tell you uh, uh, very strongly that they, that they believe that, uh, that um, that uh, Alain Kahn, who is a Fields Medal-winning mathematician, one of the top mathematicians in the world, said recently that uh, uh, he, uh, he believes that the prime numbers uh, which he studies are uh, more real than the physical world around him. Uh, the, the more you study these mathematical objects, the more you become aware and convinced of their independent reality, of the fact that you're not creating these ideas about them, 
you're discovering these ideas, the mathematics was already there. If that's true, and I believe it's true, and again, almost everyone who has ever thought very hard about mathematics believes it's true, then we have an example of something that exists because it simply cannot help existing. The natural numbers exist, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and their properties exist because it is in the very nature of numbers that they have to exist. Once you've got that, then you've at least answered the question of why there is something, even if that something is only the very abstract uh, 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 object that, that is a mathematical object. Uh, in the big questions, I talk about how it is possible then that the entire universe can be built out of mathematics, which sounds, uh, I, I suspect when you first hear it, like a strange and mystical uh, point of view, <laughs> but it is in many ways a mainstream view among physicists. Whenever you read a physics uh, paper in a physics journal, without fail, they start from the assumption that the universe is a mathematical object. They say that the, the universe is, uh, say, a four-dimensional object, uh, 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 a geometric object, a geometric object that is curved in certain ways that represent the effects of gravity. It's got some additional geometrical curlicues attached to it that represent the effects of electricity and magnetism, and they take seriously the idea that that's what the universe is. Now, when they do that, they never believe that the geometric object they're describing actually is the universe. They believe it's analogous to the universe, and that it's analogous in sufficiently important ways that understanding that mathematical object will tell us something about the universe. What I want to do is take that just one step further and suggest that Given this extremely close analogy between the mathematical objects we study in physics and the universe we actually live in, that what this suggests is that the universe we actually live in is itself a mathematical object, one probably more complicated than the ones the physicists study, but the way it's able to be so analogous to them, the way it's able to behave so much the way those mathematical objects behave, it's because it itself is also a mathematical object. And then I talk in the big questions about how, um, and again, this is not, uh, I, I feel obliged to say that it's not crazy, because I think it, it probably sounds crazy to people hearing it for the first time. But this is a view that, that mainstream physicists take very seriously. Uh, I quote in the book uh, uh, at, at some length from Max Tegmark, who's a, a, a very prominent physicist at MIT, uh, who very much takes this view, and I've given his arguments and his reasons for believing it, and I've given some other reasons for believing it. How, how can this be? Well, mathematical objects are very complex, and complex objects, uh, as we said earlier, the kind of complexity that uh, arises from them is uh, a kind of complexity that is just by virtue of their, their, their vastness, New kinds of complexity can emerge that would not have emerged from less vast objects. And among that complexity is the interaction among different parts that uh, it can, and again, I talk in some detail in the big questions about how, how this can happen, that complexity, those interactions can actually allow certain parts of that mathematical object to become self-aware and to perceive the, the, the remainder of the object in ways that will appear uh, to be a very... Uh, uh, have a very physical uh, presence. And what I want to suggest is that those self-aware parts of the universe are, are us. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. Check out our website, colinmarshallradio.com, for our complete Marketplace of Ideas interview archive and more fun stuff. My current guest is Stephen E. Landsberg, professor of economics at the University of Rochester and author of The Big Questions, tackling the problems of philosophy with ideas from mathematics, economics, and physics. And there's also, speaking of speaking of ideas that sound a little bit odd, a little bit mystical perhaps to the average reader, at first glance the idea floated in your book that, in fact, multiple universes in various configurations, perhaps infinitely many configurations, exist. And how, how do you make an idea like this, if not completely acceptable, then at least palatable and entertainable, not necessarily, I mean, it is entertaining, but more, I mean, they can enter. How, how do you make a reader able to entertain such an idea? Well, look, I, you know, I, I do talk about uh, different um, 
mathematical objects. We have, on the one hand, we have the, the natural numbers. On the other hand, we have, say, the Euclidean plane with its points and lines and so on. Each of those things, in a sense, is a universe. Um, uh, and I, you know, I give other examples of mathematical objects, and, and each one of them is a self-contained world with its substructures and with its laws. And uh, you can give examples of, of different mathematical objects. Again, I say each one of them is a universe, but uh, of course the interesting universes are the ones that look a little bit more like our universe. And again, I can talk about the, the um, toy universes the, that physicists play with in their papers. Those toy universes are all mathematical objects. And how within those universes it is possible, if they are sufficiently complex, for the mathematics itself to uh, to start reflecting on its own behavior and uh, and to become self-aware. Uh, that way in which mathematics is capable of reflecting on itself is is a key theme in modern in modern mathematics. It it underlies, for example, uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which a lot of uh, your listeners may have heard of, which which comes back to the question of the difference between truth and provability in mathematics. Um, Gerdel, uh, uh showed that there are true statements in arithmetic that can't be proven. In the book, The Big Questions, I give an explicit example of a true statement in arithmetic that can't be proven. It, it, it involves Hercules playing a game against a hydra where Hercules is trying to cut off the hydra's heads and the hydra's growing the heads back faster and faster and Hercules is trying to cut the heads off faster than the hydra can grow them. Hercules always wins that game, and the fact that he always wins that game is ultimately a statement about simple arithmetic, but it's also a statement which, although it is true, is not provable. And I, um, again, talk about in the book about how that can be and about how we can know such a thing. I should also mention that on my blog recently, which is thebigquestions.com, I gave a more detailed explanation of how we can know that there are true statements that can't be proven in mathematics. Um, the, uh, uh, all of this arises from the fact that mathematics is able, Gödel's argument, uh, which readers who go to the blog will be able to see, uh, arises from the fact that mathematics is sufficiently complex that it can talk about itself in a sense, that it can model, mathematics can model mathematics within mathematics. And that's not so different than human beings being self-aware in the sense that our brains can think about our brains within our brains. We can think about ourselves in, in something like the same sense that mathematics can talk about itself. And I want to suggest that that's no coincidence. It's really the same phenomenon. How well can this sort of, I don't know if I want to call it a worldview, but these insights that you, that you lay out in the book about how the universe might possibly work, how the world we experience with our senses is mathematical, how well can these these ideas be brought into the realm of one's everyday experience? I and mean, when, when you're living life, are you, thinking, are you thinking a lot about just the way what you're doing, what you're interacting with, what you're experiencing might be mathematical when you're just existing in it as a human? <laughs> well, sometimes, because that's one of, the, one of the things that I like to think about. But of course, <laughs> most of the time, uh, you're thinking about uh, more like things like where your next meal is coming from or... Uh, uh, what you can do to get your child to behave better, or <laughs> or how you can make your uh, how you can make your business work better, or or how you're going to get along better with the colleague in the next cub- cubicle. Um, uh, that that those of course are the things that that life is about, and and there's a lot in the big questions too about how we interact with other people in the world. Um, these these deep philosophical ideas about why there is something instead of nothing, and what role mathematics might play in that. Uh, those are are not going to change the way you live your your daily life. Uh, I uh, and I, it would be foolish if I tried to convince you otherwise. What they are going to be, uh, to my way of thinking, is a whole lot of fun to think about and a whole lot of fun to learn about. And that's that's what I've tried to emphasize in the book. And the way that humans think, and the way the way they argue about things, the way they make claims, and the way they're refuted, you get into an issue that I read a lot about. It's a pretty regular topic on, say, rationality blogs, which have become more popular on the internet lately, which is the question of whether it is possible for two honest people to actually disagree. Now, what is your stance on this? We, you know, uh, there is. Uh... 
You talk about the rationality blogs. One of the best is, is Robin Hanson's blog on overcoming bias, uh, and he is responsible for a lot of these ideas. Uh, it's uh, a remarkable, disturbing thing uh, that the more you think about it, uh, the more it seems like it's impossible for honest, truth-seeking people to disagree with each other. And the reason for that is that honest, truth-seeking people ought to trust each other's opinions as much as they trust their own. Um, if you and I disagree about something, and uh, if, uh, if I believe you're an honest truth seeker and you believe I'm an honest truth seeker, uh, it's, it's not, um, it is very hard to defend the idea that we should trust our own opinions more than we trust other people's opinions. Now, there are times when you know that you know something the other guy doesn't know. Um, but in that case, uh, first of all, you can tell them what you know, and then you should come to an agreement. And second of all, even if you don't tell him what you know, as long as he perceives the strength of your belief, as long as he or she perceives the strength of your belief, that should be enough to make him or her think that you probably do know something they don't know, and, 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 and they should adjust their, their opinions based on that. This is the... Uh, uh, this is the very disturbing part. It, it's easy to say that, well, if we all had the same information, we would all agree, uh, in the same way that uh, uh, two different well-functioning computers, you give them the same input, they're going to give you the same output. We don't all know the same thing. But what we do know when we argue, even if we don't share everything we know, we can see how strongly the other guy sticks to his or her um, opinion. Uh, I say I think the Red Sox are going to win tonight. You say the Yankees. I say no, the Red Sox. You say no, the Yankees. I say no, the Red Sox. You say no, the Yankees. Every time you come back and say no, the Yankees, that gives me new information about the strength of your belief. The fact that you are willing to stick with that belief after I've reiterated my belief three times, that tells me more than the fact that you had that belief in the first place or that you were willing to stick with it after I'd reiterated my belief only two times. Eventually, that should converge to agreement, and there are all sorts of, uh, of, 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 that's not completely obvious perhaps, but there are many, many papers in economics uh, that have tried to formalize this process and have concluded time after time after time that we've got to uh, achieve agreement, and we've got to achieve agreement pretty fast. Uh, and you can think of objections to that. Uh, you could think of objections to that conclusion. The economists have thought about these objections have tried to incorporate them in their models, and they don't make the conclusions go away. Uh, so one keeps being led back to this very disturbing, to me, result that if we are honest truth seekers, we should all agree. We obviously don't all agree, which suggests that to a very large extent, we're not seeking truth. Instead, we're posturing. We're trying to show off how smart we are. Uh, we're trying to beat the other guy. Uh, and uh, you can think of all sorts of evolutionary reasons why it might be to our advantage to try to show off uh, the same way the peacock shows off its tail. Um, but it's, it's a disturbing conclusion. I would like to think that I'm, a, I'm an honest truth seeker. On the other hand, I would also like to think that I look very good on the dance floor, <laughs> and maybe I'm fooling myself about both. But how in your own life, because I think we're all subject to this, to these, these many forces that pull us away from being honest truth seekers. Now, do you think that you, in some quality of your own life for, to this point, has, has led you to be more of an honest truth seeker? Or have you had to make a, a constant effort to be an honest truth seeker um, in, in terms of getting away from any impulses that might have you not be that? Uh, oh, of course it's a constant struggle because we're all we're all human beings and we're all subject to the same instincts and 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 behaviors that that were bred into us um, uh, yeah um, uh, doing things well is hard um, doing things well is hard and uh, uh, different people devote their energy to doing different things well and one of the things that I have tried to devote my energy to doing well is to thinking about these kinds of philosophical questions um, and, and thinking about them honestly and deeply. I'm not sure how well I've done it, but it's what I've put a lot of effort into. Um, and uh, I've, I've been able to do that because I've been blessed to have a job that lets me do that. Uh, if I were running a newspaper, then I'd be putting all that energy into running a better newspaper. If I were uh, running a factory, I'd be putting all that energy into running a better factory. And those are equally honorable uh, uh, tasks. Those are uh, 
uh, doing things well is 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 a good thing, and it's good that we have different people trying to do different things well. Uh, the particular things that I've tried to do well are to think about deep issues like this and to explain them to other people and to to um, uh, show other people uh, how it can be fun to spend a little time thinking about them yourself. One of the main notions that I think people will take away from the big questions is the idea of the economist's golden rule that you define in the book, a kind of a guide to what might produce, what actions might produce the highest amount of social good. How do you, how do you best explain the economist's golden rule? Uh, the economist's golden rule is, is a suggestion for uh, a broad rule of thumb for telling the difference between right and wrong. Um, and, and the suggestion for the broad rule of thumb is that you should count costs and benefits. You should count costs and benefits both to yourself and to other people, as if everyone counted equally. So that if you um, uh, are thinking about whether it's worth your while to get out of bed and mow the grass on a Saturday morning, uh, at some level you want to think about how unpleasant that's going to be for you, and, another, and you also want to think about how unpleasant it's going to be for the neighbor uh, if you leave, leave the grass growing and the neighbor has to look at that. And you want to give those things equal weight in some sense. I, I've tried to be a little more precise in the big questions about what it means to give them equal weight. You want to uh, get out there and mow the grass on that occasion when it matters a lot to your neighbor and when it's not that painful to you. And you want to uh, lie in bed and lounge around on those occasions when that's very important to you and the outcome is not so important to your neighbor. I don't think anyone um, uh, would have too much difficulty with thinking that that's at least part of uh, how we decide the difference between right and wrong. But I do want to suggest in the big questions that uh, if you adopt that simple rule, uh, if you commit yourself to it, then it leads you uh, sometimes into a lot of surprising places. Now, readers might expect this from a book that is concerned with these philosophical questions, but there's a lot of thinking you do in the book about you know, what, what is the right thing to do, what is the, the good thing to do, what produces the most good for humanity. A, a lot of thought about just how humanity can be brought to a better condition than they currently are. And it's kind of hard to square, I find. Well, I mean, you'll be, you, you will not have this come as a surprise, but when I see a column of yours come out or a book of yours come out or of any economist that works, that, that talks to the public like you do, inevitably there is some sector of people who respond and say, oh, Here's the heartless, heartless economist who uh, only cares about the numbers in his model going up and doesn't care about people. He needs to go read his E.F. Schumacher or what have you. Why is that? Why, why is there always that backlash that economists don't care about uh, about people? Well, I, you know, I I think to some extent uh, people look at the fact that economists use numbers or use logic. There, are, in the big questions, you won't find many numbers. You will find a lot of logic, and conclude that. Um, we care about the logic or the numbers for their own sake, whereas, in fact, we care about them precisely because they tell us about how, uh, how our policies and our beliefs are going to affect the lives of human beings. And, and ultimately, uh, nothing matters except the way things are going to affect the lives of human beings. Uh, what people sometimes don't like is being told that uh, their, their uh, preferred policies affect human beings in ways that they... Uh, did not expect or that they had not thought about, and, and sometimes it's a little uh, difficult to be asked to adjust your beliefs. Um, we also uh, call attention uh, to the fact that you sometimes have to think hard about uh, who's going to be hurt by your actions, who's going to be helped, and how you weigh those things against each other. Uh, I talk in the big questions, for example, about um, uh, policy on climate uh, change, uh, global warming, um, how should we think about what our obligations are to future generations? That's not so easy a philosophical question. Uh, if you say that we have a powerful commitment to future generations, that almost forces you to say that, well, then we've got a commitment to have more children, because if you ask those future generations what's important to them, the first thing they would tell you is, for God's sake, we want to be born in the first place. <laughs> um, if you believe everything should be driven by a commitment to future generations, you seem to be led to the conclusion that we have this obligation to have lots and lots of children, which most people find counterintuitive and, and, and wrong. On the other hand, if you start with the assumption that we have no obligation to future generations, then you end up concluding that it's perfectly okay for us to completely trash the earth. 
and that strikes most people as clearly wrong also. I'm not going to settle that um, uh, uh, conflict for you, but I am going to point out that when you get into a conflict like that, when you ask a yes or no question, do we have a strong obligation to future generations, yes or no, and when the yes answer leads you to one conclusion that you really don't like, and the no answer leads you to a different conclusion that you really don't like, that means you've got something to think about. It doesn't mean that it's not reconcilable, but it does mean you have something, uh, you, you're up against an issue that's going to require some thought, that's going to require some hard thought. And when I say require, of course, you're always entitled to ignore any issue you want. But if you really want to understand this issue, if you really want to think about it, if you really want to um, determine what our obligations are, and those things end up affecting practical questions of policy, practical questions that are being debated in Copenhagen right now, if you want to get those things right, you are going to have to face that kind of difficult question. Some people would prefer not to, I'm sure. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm hoping to show them, and I've said this a few other times here, is that it's not so bad because uh, not only uh, is it useful to think about those things, but we can also make it a lot of fun. Now, with the, I suppose, it broadly considered, you might call it a wave of, of popular economics books and popular economics material, there seems to have been more of that from the mid-90s onward, arguably a wave in large part started by your book, The Armchair Economist. Um, what, do, considering there has been so much more economic material just in the public eye, do you think there's less of this misperception that economists don't care about people, or or am I just kind of optimistic that that might decrease as more economic thinking gets into the general discourse? Well, I'm 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 honestly not sure. I have an opinion on that question. I I would. Uh... Uh, misconceptions about what economists do or what economists care about. How do they compare now to what they were uh, 15, 20 years ago before I wrote my book, The Armchair Economist, and then before everyone else came along? Uh, I'm not sure of the answer to that. I, I, I'm not sure you know, what people were thinking 20 years ago. Uh, I do think there are a lot of good books out there about economics. Uh, since you mentioned uh, Freakonomics and, and Steve Levitt, which I think uh, Freakonomics is a great book. I have not read Super Freakonomics yet. Um, uh, just to draw the distinction there, uh, he does what he does extremely well, and I think I do what I do extremely well. Uh, but the way I describe the difference usually is that Levitt is out to dazzle you with facts, and I'm out to dazzle you with logic. And uh, both things are fun in their own ways, but they're, they're, they're slightly different enterprises. Now, before we call it an, inter an interview, I want to go back to something you said a, a couple minutes ago, just two or so minutes, about about making this information fun. And what I want to ask is, does that enterprise of making this stuff fun, does that require does that require putting yourself in the shoes of a reader, or does it require more simply getting clear about what you find fun, what you find interesting, and just getting with as much honesty as possible and clarity your passion for it on the page? Well, both those things matter very much. Uh, but uh, I, I do have a lot of experience teaching, and I've been very successful as a teacher. My students elected me teacher, uh, professor of the year at the, at the University of Rochester last year. Uh, I've, I've, I've been a, a very popular teacher for a very long time, and I, I think that uh, that comes, uh, people often ask me, uh, um, colleagues who would like to do better in the classroom often ask me what the secret is, and I always tell them that the secret is putting yourself in the shoes of the student and, and asking yourself, uh, when you explain these things, how it's going to sound to somebody who's hearing it for the first time and what natural questions they're going to have. And then listening to the students when they ask questions, not, not uh, 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 believing in advance that you know what their question is going to be, but listening carefully to the questions they ask. Uh, I've done the same thing with my students that I've done with my readers for over the years. Uh, I've been writing online columns for 15, 20 years now, and I get a lot of feedback from readers, uh, and I, I, I read what the readers send me, and now I'm blogging at thebigquestions.com, and I, I get, I've, I've had a, just, I've been blessed with uh, terrific uh, high-quality comments from my readers there, but I learn, I really try to learn from that stuff what things are hard for people to understand and why it's hard for them to understand, and I experiment with different explanations. And, and I see which explanations work better, and, and I, I think that the readers of my book will have benefited from the fact that, that I've had all that back and forth with readers over the, over the many years and, and learned something about uh, uh, better ways of making things both clear and entertaining. Um, for example, in the book, you know, I give what I think is the clearest 
and an easiest to understand explanation of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that you're going to find anywhere. It is uh, watered down only in the sense that I've left out unnecessary technical stuff, but it is, uh, uh, it's not one of these vague descriptions that you get in so many popular science books. <laughs> it's a very clear statement of exactly what the uncertainty principle does and does not say, and I think I've done a pretty good job of making it clear. The name of the book, once again, is The Big Questions, Tackling the Problems of Philosophy with Ideas from Mathematics, Economics, and Physics. Stephen Landsberg, thank you so much for taking the time to thank come on the program. Thank you, and I'll, I'll mention again that the blog is at thebigquestions.com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. You can find out more about this show and listen to all the old interviews at colinmarshallradio.com. Check out the website of Ben Althouse, who produces our theme music at benalthouse.com. If you have any feedback, positive, negative, or otherwise, send that along to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.